I wanted to go back to um, the Iran stuff that we were talking about yesterday um, and the assertion from the administration that billions of dollars in escrow accounts had been um, sent back or withdrawn by Iran during the previous administration without any restrictions at all. Do you have any more? Yeah, all I'll say is so after the previous administration withdrew from the JCPOA mm -hmm. and reestablished or reactivated these accounts, um, they did not set up any procedures to give the U.S. government either visibility or oversight into how the money was being spent. Now, look, that wasn't required by law, but we have decided. Well, in fact, it was, wasn't it? it? No, it wasn't required well, by law well, that they set up visit. That they yeah, but set it was up. required by U.S. law, by law that was signed by the president, that, several presidents, that that any money in these accounts be spent on for only humanitarian it's purposes. not it, well no that's not quite accurate it's, it could be humanitarian <clears throat> or other non-sanctionable activities so there are two point uh, well, two uh, uh, so, okay. two points so they could so, uh, two points one um the the so they could buy the some Iranians snickers bars okay could, could non humanitarian but non-humanitarian other non-sanctionable act activities but i think the, the the larger point i was making without direct visibility and without a mechanism for oversight, mm -hmm. you are largely uh, asking to trust the Iranians, which is not something that we are willing to do for a number of reasons, which is why when we are set setting up these counts or setting up the regime for these accounts in Qatar, we are setting up visibility and oversight mechanisms so we have clear visibility into how the money is being spent and have the ability to oversee it uh, and take action if it's being spent yeah, for non-humanitarian measures. Okay, so I, I'm still pressing for details about how many billions were taken out of India and, and, and Turkey and, and Japan and South Korea that, that the Iranians were able to spend on, you know, willy-nilly. So we don't have perfect visibility into this question because of the situation I just outlined, which is we don't have visibility into the accounts and how they were being used. So you we don't do, well, let me just say, we do um, uh, have information that has led us to conclude that they were spent down by billions of dollars, in some cases all the way to zero, but we do not have perfect visibility about the, 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 the I, I, I don't have specific details on that. Okay. It's my understanding that, in fact, these countries, particularly India, South Korea, and Japan, um, were well aware of OFAC restrictions on the escrow funds, on the funds that they were holding in escrow, and would not give the Iranians anything uh, unless it was, uh, you know, specifically approved uh, or, and sent through either the failed European Instex exchange or then the almost failed Swiss humanitarian channel. Two is things. That, is, that, is that incorrect? Uh, first of all, those aren't the only countries. China is another country um, uh, with, uh, that had one of these accounts. Uh, well, uh, I, you know I, what? I, the, but, but when it, was the last time the Chinese like, uh, you know, I, obeyed U.S. That, sanctions? Or, that's my know, point. Respected that, that, them. That, no, that, I'm talking about it, countries. I, like I know, India, and I'm about to. India I'm, had the largest amount. And I'm about to get, maybe get to that. Okay. I can't speak to the other countries' procedures, but what I can say is from our perspective, we think it's important that the United States government itself have direct visibility and direct oversight okay. of these transactions, which, why, which is why we insisted on it as part of these negotiations. Okay, and so your direct transparency, your direct visibility into the accounts that still are in South Korea, Japan, India, Turkey, how, how, much, are, how much are left in those? Uh, that's the same. We do not have direct visibility. We do not know well, with any yeah, sort of fidelity. You just said your whole point was that, that, to, that with the account that's being set, that we want to have with the account that's being set up in Qatar. in was to get direct visibility, and now we you're are getting, no, no, we are getting direct. That you don't have any visibility. We, no, that's not what I said. I'm saying well, we are able to get set up this new account in Qatar. We are able to set it up under rules that allow us to have direct visibility into how the transactions yeah, well, are being, or how the money is being spent. But, but, but the, the claim that was made on Monday and Tuesday was that when this administration came in, you set up these specific rules that, and restrictions on what and how these funds being held in escrow could be used that, so that you would have direct visibility into it. And now you're saying that the previous administration allowed billions of dollars to go to Iran without any restrictions on them so, but the visibility that you say that you got three years ago you don't have because because so, because you can't tell me or, I, or treasury I, I, can't say how much or 
you know, I guess we could go to India, Japan, China, and, 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 and Turkey and ask them. I don't know that they'll tell us. But if you don't know how much is left in these accounts, um, for sure, you're just guessing, aren't you? Uh, at saying it, at saying that they've all been depleted. It, it is not just. It, it is not, in some cases we have very low visibility. In some cases we have better visibility, which leads us to believe that the billions billions have been spent. And in some cases we believe. Okay, well, where's down, the better down, visibility and how much down, is left in those down, accounts? That's what I said. Much, I'm not. And how I, much did the Iranians get out that's during said, the previous administration? Well, if you can't say that, how can you make the? I don't understand how I, you can because make that. there is some information that we have available to us with good fidelity, and that's what I've been able to provide, and others that we don't. Well, with good fidelity, what? But what does that mean? That you suspect that someone entered No, it means one, that, that like, the statement you know, I, I said I that we can see a, that they've a, spent a down billions. At, you know, M&T Bank, right? And, 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 and draw it down to zero. Um, and it, you should be able to tell, or someone should be able to tell, if it was at zero or not. Uh, right? Uh, Why can't you tell? How, what, I, I don't understand. These are not accounts held in the United States. We I do know. Not have per, so we do but, not have perfect look, visibility India into them. a partner. Them. Japan and South Korea are treaty allies of the United States. How do you not know and how I said, much is left with, in these accounts? With respect to some accounts, we are able to see. We're, not, uh, uh, I do not have all of those details available. With some accounts, we do not have perfect visibility. What we can see is that billions of dollars were spent uh, down without any U.S. government visibility or oversight at the time that money was being spent. how you can say that without knowing how much is in the accounts. We have a variety of ways to gather information. So do, you know, That's so do I. And one of them is talking to former administration <laughs> officials who say this never, you know, one of them is talking to former people who were in office during the time that what you said would say happen, uh, was happening, uh, and they say it didn't happen. Okay. And they say there was only a very small amount that was sent to Iran, and it was for humanitarian purposes, and it was through mainly the Swiss humanitarian channel, which only succeeded in apparently one or two small, very small transactions in the tens of thousands of dollars. And then there was also Instex, which completely failed and didn't do anything. Uh, so I don't, I, 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 I'll, I, I'll drop I, it. I, but. I take their claims, but that is just not the information that we have. Uh, Go ahead. Does somebody just want to pursue Iran? Could I switch yeah, topics? If, if I may, let's go ahead. Go, go ahead, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> there's this to, uh, to, to North Korea, actually, uh, with uh, Putin and, uh, and Kim Jong-un meeting. Um, I know there, there have been comments on that previously, but could you say particularly if there's, uh, the Russians are talking about satellite cooperation, what would that mean? How, how much of a concern is that in terms of the implications for North Korea's program and for, for Russia's military? Uh, I, I would say it is troubling when you see the, the uh, Russians uh, talking about cooperating with North Korea on programs that would, viol that would violate UN Security Council resolutions that Russia itself voted for. Now, we obviously don't, uh, we haven't seen uh, the full manifestation of this meeting yet or what the full outcomes of this meeting will be. Um, but when you see the, the two, um, uh, uh, when you see Kim Jong-un uh, vowing to provide full unconditional support for Russia's so-called sacred fight uh, to defend its security interests, which of course is not what it's doing with respect to the, the war in Ukraine. That of course is troubling. Uh, when you see what looks to be increased cooperation and probably military transfers, as we've said for some time, we have reason to believe they were uh, going to discuss military transfers. Um, that is quite troubling and would potentially be in violation of multiple UN Security Council resolutions. You say potentially, I mean, one of the, one of the things that they're mentioning is um, uh, on the the satellite specifically, I know you said you don't have the full yeah. manifest uh, of what's uh, what's going on. But in terms of what, I mean, the, UN, the United States has said that the satellite program that North Korea has is used to develop ballistic missiles. Ballistic missiles, missiles exactly. Is that, is that a concern that that Russia could be actively? Uh, yeah. Um, Promoting, uh, improving the the North Korean. A a absolutely, that's why I rec that's why I, that was what I was referring to in my reference to the multiple UN Security Council resolutions uh, 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 against North Korea's ballistic missile program, which Russia itself voted for and now could potentially be violating. Um, okay, okay, just one more. Yeah. I mean, it just yeah. turns to the consequences. Uh, I think Jake Sullivan himself has said that there is a potential for. Just to put a words into a potential for sanctions for further actions on this. What is the United States looking at? I mean, is there is there the potential for for some action uh, on the basis of this? So we're going to watch very closely what comes out of, out of this. I spoke to this uh, uh, somewhat the other day. Um, uh, we're looking at you know I will say there are two different 
possibility, the possibilities of, of weapons flowing two different ways here, right? Um, so um, uh, uh, with respect to either direction, uh, uh, we would watch very closely and be concerned uh, and will not hesitate to pose sanctions uh, if and when uh, it's appropriate. And then I want to speak specifically for a second about the idea of um, R North Korea providing weapons to Russia, which uh, I spoke to the other day, but uh, I, I don't think you were here. One, just the overall context, I think it's important to restate again that, you know, a year and a half ago, Vladimir Putin launched this war uh, thinking he was going to restore the glory of the Russian Empire, failed in all of his maximalist imperialist aims, and now a year and a half later, after losing tens of thousands of Russian soldiers and spending billions and billions of dollars, um, uh, here he is uh, uh, begging Kim Jong-un for help. So um, it says something about the overall context of how this war is going for Russia. And with respect to what any outcomes might be, we have taken a number of entity, uh, actions already to sanction entities that have brokered arms sales between North Korea and Russia. Uh, and we won't hesitate to impose additional actions uh, if appropriate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, let me, let me, no, 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 let, she raised her hand. Go, go ahead. Right. Um, we'll get to your side. Has there been any inter interaction between U.S. officials and Chinese officials on this matter, given it would likely be a concern of Beijing if uh, Russia were to provide nuclear technology uh, to not, you? Not, not that I'm aware of. I'm not aware of any spe specific interaction. But the meeting just happened today, so I, I wouldn't rule it out. And, you know, we are, we, we do have somewhat regular engagements with Chinese officials um, uh, going forward. Um, we have, uh, I will say, the Sec Secretary Blinken raised North Korea's nuclear program and North Korea's ballistic missile program uh, in his engagements with Chinese officials when we were in Beijing, and we regularly raise that in our uh, conversations with Chinese officials because we think because of the close relationship that China has had with North Korea, that if they're willing to play a productive role, they're able to, and they have some influence with the, the regime in North Korea. So I would anticipate we would raise it, but I'm not aware of any specific interactions that have taken place yet. We can meet with the, whoever the Chinese delegation leader is um, at UNGA next week. I, I don't have any specific meetings to announce yet, but stay tuned over the, the course of the next couple of days. Jan Janie, go ahead. Thank you, Matt. Uh, two questions on North Korea. North Korea launched the two ballistic missiles into the East Sea yesterday ahead of the North Korea-Russia summit. What do you think is the intention behind this? So I won't speak to their intentions. Um, always tough getting the mind of that regime uh, in particular, but I will say that the United States condemns the DPRK's uh, recent ballistic missile launches as we have condemned their previous ballistic missile launches. The launches are in violation of multiple United Nations Security Council resolutions uh, and are the latest in the, the series of launches that pose a direct threat, threat to the DP, DPRK's neighbors. Uh, they undermine regional security and our commitment to the defense of the Republic of Korea and Japan remain ironclad. Uh, President Putin and uh, the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un are further strengthening their military cooperation at the talks. How will the United States choose a diplomatic or military approach to resolve the North Korean nuclear and the missile issues in the future? We have always made clear that we uh, are ready for diplomacy, are open to diplomacy, would welcome diplomacy with North Korea to um, uh, uh, address our concerns uh, about its uh, nuclear weapons program. And uh, to date, as I believe you're well aware, uh, well aware, they have shown no interest in such uh, diplomacy. So you still so, expect to dialogue with North Korea? Dialogue is still open. I ex did you say I expected? Yeah, I, expected. I, I do not. <laughs> I do not. Get, based on their their behavior over the last two and a half years, no, I would not expect them to engage in diplomacy with us. Get, just based on how they've uh, uh, reacted for the first two and a half years, over two and a half years now, this administration. But uh, the door always remains open from our side. Thank you. So go ahead. I was just curious as uh, to why you guys insist on using the term "begging." You know, like he's going cap in hand. Well, in fact, it is a North Korean leader who is visiting Russia. Russia is a vast country. He's invited him and so on. And according to what we know, most of North Korea's equipment, I mean military equipment, is basically Russian-made. But, you know, why the term? Uh, I don't think that at the beginning of this war, Vladimir Putin would have anticipated that a year and a half in, he would having to be scrounging around. Having, he would have to be scrounging around. To, sorry, let me finish. He would have to be scrounging around the world, um, uh, including with international pariahs like Kim Jong Un, asking for um, uh, assistance. 
and potentially in return having to provide assistance to the DPRK that would violate UN Security Council resolutions that Russia itself voted for. So, I mean, you can use whatever word you want to characterize it, it but I will stand by the words back, I used. I'll scratch your back kind of it, thing. It, no, that's not begging, is it? I, I, I stand by my characterization. Exactly. Michelle. Um, on, on Bahrain, on the meetings that you just had, um, this um, human rights activist, Maryam al Khalija Kawaja, I'm sorry, I'm butchering her name, is heading back there to raise um, uh, the profile of her father's case. I wonder if the secretary raised that in his meetings today. Uh, the meeting is ongoing right now as we speak, so I can't speak to what, obviously what happened in the meeting that is ongoing. Um, but we do regularly raise human rights concerns um, uh, with countries around the world, including specific human rights cases. The secretary regularly does that uh, as part of his engagements. But again, I, 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 I don't know what's happened in a meeting that's going on right One other human, right rights, now. human rights question. Has the, has the uh, administration decided what it's going to do with aid to Egypt? Um, uh, we have um, uh, not made a formal determination as of yet, but I think, as you know, um, the deadline for that is approaching relatively soon. Could you just follow on Bahrain? Yeah. Um, I know you said it's ongoing, but in terms of what it was signed today, um, what, what in substantive terms will change with the U.S. relationship with Bahrain? I mean, the Fifth Fleet is already there. And the Secretary spoke about intelligence cooperation. Uh, what, what changes after today? So two things. One, it, or three things. First, as you know, we already have a, a substantial security relationship with, with Bahrain. Um, what we believe this agreement represents first, or second, I guess, if I've made the first background point, um, a new framework to enhance cooperation across a wide range of areas from defense and security to emerging technology, trade and investment. Um, we believe it's the latest manifestation of that enduring commitment that we've shown to Bahrain and to the region in support of peace. Um, and then I think the, the last point I would make about it is that this is a bilateral agreement um, between the United States and Bahrain, and Bahrain, but we see it as potentially the cornerstone for cooperation among a broader group of countries that share mutual interests and a common vision with respect to deterrence, diplomacy, and escalation. So, Alex, go ahead. I have a Ukraine related question, but before I want to go back to Iran, if I may, uh, we discussed in this room yesterday, also today, Kirby also mentioned that uh, if Iran violates the, 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 the let's say, uh, the deal, we will just lock it down. So we will not send that funding. Um, it goes back to my question. Do you, can you just give us the timetable of uh, the transaction process? What's going to look like? How many tranches will be sent? It's six billion will be divided. And at, at what point you will be able to weigh in? And do you have established mechanism to lock it down? Uh, I am not going to get into the, the exact details of the transactions mm -hmm. as they move from South Korea through banks in Europe, ultimately to these uh, end accounts in Qatar. And, uh, but we expect in the coming days or so that the, 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 that money will move ultimately to the final de destination in Qatar. With respect to uh, the mechanisms that are available to us, we have complete visibility into these accounts and have the ability to um, lock them down if we see Iran attempting to take actions that are in violation of this agreement and in violation of our sanctions. I'm not going to get into what the exact technical details are, um, but we have the full agreement to stop uh, their access to this account going forward. Thank you. About more Iran, uh, Mahsa Act just passed uh, Congress yesterday. Uh, as you know, uh, it uh, demands the administration to sanction Iran's human rights violators, particularly uh, the leaders of Iran. Um, do you find it appropriate that, I, I know there's not a law yet, so they, they will be set outside and the presidential signature is necessary, but Congress already have expressed uh, its will. Uh, do you find it appropriate that right when uh, you know, Iranian people are, uh, you know, uh, going through this painful process, this first anniversary of a uh, mass uh, murder, uh, uh, murder, do you find it appropriate that the butcher of Iran will not only be allowed to enter, to enter the United States territory, but also will be welcomed by local human rights, uh, local NGOs, you know, such as uh, Council of Foreign Relations, you know, uh, led by former administration officials? How appropriate is that? So I will just say that um, uh, as has been longstanding precedent has happened under, you know, going back really since the UN was founded and, and based in New York. Um, we have an obligation as the host country um, to admit representatives of other countries, no matter what we think of those countries' policies. And that has long been the case as our obligation of the United Nations. With respect to um, the, the President of Iran being hosted 
uh, uh, at a uh, think tank in New York. I won't speak to that in, in uh, particular. They're obviously a, um, an independent organization that can make their own decisions. But I would say that when any organization hosts um, uh, such a figure uh, with a long history of spreading mistruths and saying that things that are that um, uh, making claims that are not accurate, we would just urge them to um, uh, watch very carefully what he says, make sure they hold him accountable, make sure that uh, uh, their members have full access to truthful, accurate information. I would expect that they would do that. And the fact so that Beat, go, one more, and then I'm going to move around. So the fact that Beat has the house, will that change your calculus on the end? Uh, in terms of sanctioning, you know, Supreme Leader before it, you know, it become, becomes a law. Uh, I'm just not going to speak preview any specific sanctions. Come back to well, uh, let me the go to Libya. The, the previous, the, the, the answer that you gave just prior to that was about Raisi speaking at CFR. CFR. Yeah. So back in the previous administration, there had been restrictions placed on Iranian diplomats um, going to uh, New York, which, which limited their movements to between their mission or residence and the UN itself. Now, recognizing that Manhattan is not exactly in a huge uh, area, still CFR is outside of what the, the range, what the perimeter had been for them before. I recognize that Shortly after this administration took office, you guys rescinded uh, those uh, restrictions. But there are people who are saying that they should be reenacted, uh, particularly since the election of Raisi, which happened after after that. Is there any consideration being given to going back to the? previous administration's restrictions on Iranian diplomat Not diplomatic that movements. Not no? That. And then um, secondly on Iran at the UN, um, I believe it's October 8th that the, um, under the uh, JCPOA, which is, you know, on life support, if it still can be said to be on life support, um, the UN arms embargo will be lifted. There we go. And there is a growing call, bipartisan call, in Congress um, for there to be a snapback of, of sanctions, something that the administration has opposed. Uh, are you prepared now to um, change your position? Or you still think it would be okay for <clears throat> the arm, arms embargo to, to, be, uh, to, to disappear? Um, Matt, let me look into that. I'm not focused on with you know, things that have still a month to go before we get there. It's a, it's a fair question. I'll just have to look in, into an okay. answer. Well, maybe you should be focused on I, I, because I, a number of topics I deal with every day at this point. I know. And typically I know. Think, well, so my, my time horizon can typically be shorter so, than a month so, so on, so <laughs> on things I'm prepared for. Already, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Olivia, go ahead. Can you tell us about the purpose and circumstances of Ambassador Tracy's visit with Paul Whalen? Uh, has that meeting already happened? Uh, was it at our request? Is there a readout of the visit overall? Sure. So um, uh, Ambassador Tracy did meet with uh, Paul Whalen earlier today. Um, it was a, a consular visit. Um, uh, we believe Paul continues to show tremendous courage in the face of his wrongful de detention. Ambassador Tracy reiterated to him that President Biden and Secretary Blinken are committed to bring him home. Um, uh, you may recall Secretary Blinken had a phone call with Paul Whelan uh, around a month ago, a little under a month ago, um, where he uh, delivered that same message to him that we are working very hard to bring him home and we will continue to do so. Separately, but maybe relatedly, can you confirm these reports that have emerged that Russian interlocutors have specifically raised the case of Vadim Prasikov in potential prisoner swap negotiations? Uh, I, I cannot, and I will say, as we have said a number of times, we have found that when it comes to our efforts to bring home these wrongfully detained Americans, uh, the substance of negotiations and what we're trying to do to bring them home in any specifics, it's oftentimes not helpful to our effort to speak to those publicly, so I can't do so here. Absent from concrete conversations about his case, uh, is his case something that the U.S. would consider in a potential swap? Uh, and if so, have you raised it with the Germans? I'm just not going to, I'm not going to speak at all. Obviously, we have shown that, that we are, you know, uh, we are willing to make tough decisions because we believe it is so important to um, uh, bring Americans home, but that is a general statement. I don't want to speak to any specific um, uh, in individual that might be detained 
in the U.S. or in another country. So, uh, go ahead. Okay. Well, uh, I wanted to ask about uh, regarding Mexico. What can President Biden do to stop the sex trafficking of children coming across our border from Mexico, especially in the state of California? And I have a follow-up. Well, we have um, uh, obviously. Uh, let me try to speak to what this department's work is, uh, which is to counter human trafficking, and we have taken a number of steps to do that. But with respect to specific border operations, I would prefer you to the Department of Homeland Security. Okay, and finally, what is the Biden administration response to the Sound of Freedom movie that highlights the international child sexy? Sex trafficking problem is a horrific problem. Uh, I'm not familiar with that specific movie. Obviously, as I said, we've taken a number of uh, actions to counter child trafficking uh, around the world, but I wouldn't want to comment on that specific movie. Go okay. ahead. Thank you, Mike. The Christian regional government, in a letter, has appealed to President Biden and this administration to intervene in a deepening crisis between Erbil and Baghdad. They also urged the administration to mediate between Erbil and Baghdad for their disputes. How do you view this charge you request on letter, and will you mediate or increase your engagement between Erbil and Baghdad to overcome these disputes? So I'm not going to discuss um, diplomatic correspondence between the President uh, and the KRG, um, but I will reiterate, uh, as we did in the February U.S.-Iraq hi Higher uh, Coordinating Committee in Washington, that we continue to urge the government of Iraq uh, and KRG officials to resolve their budget disputes in a manner that benefits the Iraqi citizens as the Iraqi constitution requires. Thank you very much. Uh, you had told me to ask the ambassador of the U.S. in Islamabad, so I asked him about his meeting with the election commission chief. Uh, he did not answer me, he just sent me the press release back, which he had issued in August that U.S. wants to see fair elections being held and stuff like that. But what hurted me, Matt, and you are in the position to answer that, that when I ask him that, Mr. Ambassador, do you think since last one year the relationship between human-to-human -human relations of the America and Pakistan towards America, do you think it has improved or it has decreased? If I can't even get an answer for this much question, then what is diplomacy about? Uh, I, I will answer the question this way, as I have said, I believe, before in answer, response to similar questions, that. Pakistan is an important partner of ours, and we greatly value the relationship between our countries, both between our two governments and the people-to-people -people, people connections. Uh, Matt, one question about Afghanistan. Uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan are having border issues on Turkham since the last few days. Thousands of people are stranded. What is the U.S. position on that? Uh, obviously, we would uh, encourage the, those two governments to work together to resolve that issue. Go ahead. Go, no, go, let me, I got I to gotta get to other Thank people in the room. Much, uh, so, House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman uh, Michael McCall has uh, requested testimony from three Biden administration spokesperson, including our dear friend Ned Price, uh, on the chaotic group withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, will state encourage Price testimony before the House Committee? So, um, uh, we obviously are in receipt of that request. Um, Chairman McCall has asked for uh, interviews with a number of officials from the State Department and has asked for a number of documents. We have been, we have provided uh, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of pages of documents with respect to his uh, inquiries in this regard. We will continue to, to cooperate with his committee to provide the information uh, that it needs. We have already provided interviews with a number of officials and will continue to do so, to do so uh, as appropriate and when appropriate, uh, balancing the House's need to get information that it needs to do its job with our ability to pr protect certain privileges that the executive branch holds. Uh, but I wouldn't want to speak to any potential interview other than to say that we'll continue to work through these questions with the committee. So the Chairman Committee uh, also claimed that uh, these administration spokesperson misled the American people during the run-up to the American withdrawal from Afghanistan, painting a far rosier picture than the reality on the ground. So my question is that are these spokespersons or you are they responsible for these statements that he's referring? Um, because, I mean, are you just doing your job or, you know, or somebody else is responsible for uh, uh, these kind of statements? I, I don't want to get into that in detail other than to say I, I, I was not here inside the government at the time, but I, I do believe um, what the government has said at a number of occasions is that the situation changed very rapidly in a way that, that could not be anticipated. So one last question, sir. So Mr. Go, President go, of Pakistan. Go, 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 go. Hold, everyone, so, chill. Go ahead. Uh, what, President, one more, of Pakistan, no. uh, President of Pakistan uh, proposes November 6 uh, as the election date. Uh, as according to the Constitution, uh, election should be held in 90 days. But Election Commission of Pakistan said 
it is not able to hold elections in that short notice. Looks like another constitutional crisis in Pakistan. Your thoughts on that? Um, as we do with countries around the world, we urge Pakistan to hold a free and fair, uh, free and fair and timely elections, and to respect human rights and fundamental freedoms in the rule of law. And we urge. Pakistani authorities to move forward with the electoral process in a manner consistent with Pakistan's laws, as we do with countries around the world. Saeed, go Thank ahead. Thank you. Uh, today marks the 30th anniversary of the Oslo Accord that was so famously signed on the White House uh, uh, lawn. Uh, it called for a Palestinian state um, uh, in, by 1998, uh, of course, that date is gone. The situation is a lot worse today. Um, settlement spreadings. Now, you, you're, you're fully aware of what what's going on. And I, I'm wondering whether the time has come to really pull the, the plug on, the, on these accords and perhaps pursue something, something entirely different, maybe, you know, list loftier goals or, or something that can they, they, the United States can lead. So we don't believe so. Um, uh, we continue to focus on our, our efforts on um, affirmative and practical steps that could promote um, uh, a negotiated two-state solution, but at the same time, um, we believe it's important to advance equal measures of freedom and dignity um, uh, as a means to advance further a negotiated uh, two-state solution. Do you believe that the elements or the components for a two-state solution are there, are still there, it can be done? Uh, I believe that it is important to, now, let me refer to something the Secretary said when he was asked, or when he spoke to this um, uh, in a speech in December 20, uh, 2022. He spoke to this exactly. He said, we know at this moment the prospects of a two-state solution feel remote. And that may be an understatement to some. I believe you would uh, agree with those remarks based on what you said. So, but we are committed to providing or to preserving a horizon of hope, and that means holding firm to the values that have anchored the, fir the friendship between the United States and Israel across countless transitions in government uh, uh, in both of our countries. So the two-state solution has long been the United States policy, and it continues to be our policy that we will push for, um, uh, and we believe it's important to do so. So why not, if you're still committed to the two-state solution, you know, ultimately, uh, why not recognize uh, a, a state of Palestine saying that we would like to see this state of Palestine on such and such land, you know, this land that was occupied or a portion uh, thereof and, and so on. And in the meantime, these things ought to be negotiated among the party. We don't believe that would be a productive step at this time. So, uh, you, know, just, just, yeah. you know, you, you, you talked about um, the Secretary saying that in December 2022. Since, since the, he made those comments, Children who were not even conceived yet have been born. Do you think you're further away or closer today I, to a two-state solution? I don't think I want to set, make a judgment about further or closer, um, other than to say, again, it remains our policy and something right. we regularly push for in, in dialogue with uh, officials from, from the government. And then itself. secondly, and I don't think you'll have a lot on this, but the case of Elizabeth Surkov, uh, who is this uh, Israeli-Russian citizen who's been um, being held in, in Iraq, uh, but who has connections to the U.S. Um, do you have anything more uh, uh, on that? I don't. I'm happy to look into it further and see, see if there's Matt, more. Matt, just a quick question on the quick. visa waiver. May I just, just yeah. a quick follow-up. Uh, is the U.S. still committed to uh, in, ensuring uh, Israel adherence to the principle of blue is blue uh, prior to admission? of the U.S. Uh, visa waiver program? Uh, I, I, I will say is that we are, are if by blue, you refer to blue passports, yes, is that what you mean? Yes, yeah, blue, um, blue. I mean, are, that's, that's what they call, you guys call we it. Are, we are committed to the principle that all American citizens uh, be treated equally, yes. Um, go, work some of this. One, go ahead, Jeff. Um, is it still the case that Morocco has not put forward a formal request for U.S. assistance uh, in the wake of the I, I do have an update on um, a, a conversations with the government of Morocco and uh, our actions with respect to uh, relief efforts in Morocco. Um, uh, one is that the United States uh, Agency for International Development has deployed a small assessment team to Morocco to liaise with local responders assessing the situation and identifying humanitarian needs. Uh, and second, that we are exchanging specialized technical expertise uh, through the United States Geological Survey. And we continue to be uh, further in close consultation with the Moroccan government on how the U.S. can best support their efforts uh, uh, to provide a humanitarian response to this tragedy. 
have they re uh, rejected any U.S. Uh, offers of assistance? I, I wouldn't frame it that way. I would frame it that we are in discussions with them about what we can best provide to support their efforts. So, a very quick follow-up. Yeah. Uh, the U.S. aid statement is talking about $1 million in support. Does that mean to, like, to local groups or to people there? It won't be Americans? I would refer to U.S. aid sure. for the specifics on, on, on how that money will be used. Could deployed. I stay in Africa? Yeah. Uh, Mali, uh, there's an attack today uh, uh, purportedly by Tureg separatists. Uh, generally speaking, I mean, what's the concern level about the new flare up of violence in Mali and the departure of the UN peacekeepers in the presence of Wagner there? Uh, to what extent are those factors? We continue to be concerned both with the situation on the ground in Mali and um, uh, with the presence of Wagner or whatever you call the remnants of Wagner after the death of Yevgeny Prigozhin. We believe that they're a destabilizing force in a country that uh, did not need further destabilization. We go. Uh, go ahead. Um, so last week, uh, NATO Secretary General Jen Stoltenberger made some comments on kind of what precipitated the war in Ukraine, and I'll just quote him here. President Putin declared in autumn of 2021 and actually sent a draft treaty that they wanted NATO to sign to promise no more NATO enlargement. That was what he sent to us, and it was a precondition to not invade Ukraine. Of course, we didn't sign that. Um, so I'm just wondering, there were also some remarks by Counselor Blinken last year that the Secretary U.S. Blinken? Sorry, Secretary, Secretary yeah. Blinken. I didn't it. know if you meant Councillor Chalet or, you know, but um, I, I, I misspeak enough that I will, am not faulting you for having done so, trust me. <laughs> um, so, but Blinken apparently expressed a similar uh, sentiment. So I'm just wondering, in hindsight of, you know, what has transpired in the war, whether that decision was worth it and maybe what was behind that decision. So I'm not going to speak to uh, uh, what were private diplomatic conversations. I will reiterate what we said at the time, which was, NATO has an open door policy, and we are not we were not willing to compromise NATO's open door policy, nor do believe we believe it is appropriate to, to compromise NATO open door policy, nor is NATO in any way a threat to, to Russia. NATO was a is was then and is now a defensive alliance. We always made clear in the run up to that war that we were in willing to engage uh, in uh, diplomacy with Russia. The Ukrainians made clear that they were in willing to engage in diplomacy with Russia about legitimate regional security concerns. Uh, but we were not going to compromise NATO, one of NATO's founding principles. And I certainly don't believe NATO was, or that Ukraine, although I won't speak for them, NATO, Ukraine did not seem to want to compromise their own right to determine their future as a country. And Go ahead. can I just get one quick yeah. follow-up? So when you weigh that, I, one is weighing that open-door policy with, you know, the horrible consequences of the war, which Stoltenberg, Stoltenberg cites as one of Russia's primary negotiating points. And then two is, do you not see any security concern, even if it is a defensive alliance, a security concern with, you know, NATO has a, NATO members often hold U.S. military assets on their territory. So is there not a I, concern from not wanting that on your border if you're kind of one of our ad adversaries like I, China or Russia. I will just say I think um, you might be being, a, with all due respect, a little too um, incredulous with respect to your treatment of statements reported and offers reported to being made by Vladimir Putin. What we believe and what we believe has borne out, and some of the reason we believe this is because what it's what Vladimir Putin said himself, is that he has never believed Ukraine was a legitimate country and he always wanted to restore Ukraine. Uh, uh, not restore, he wanted to make Ukraine a part of Russia. Um, he said that openly. His actions indicated that's what he's be he, he believed, and that's what his actions today continue to, to show he still believes. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'm, I'm going to work around. Go ahead. Thank you, Matt. Just real quickly, do you have any comment on the appointment of Ms. Kamikawa as the new Foreign Minister of Japan, and are there any plans set for Secretary Blinken to speak with her? Uh, I'm sure he, sure he will speak with her in the coming days, as he regularly does when uh, new foreign min uh, ministers are uh, appointed. The U.S.-Japan relationship has never been stronger. It is a – our alliance is a cornerstone of peace, security, and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific and across the world. Um, our government has had an excellent working relationship with the previous cabinet, and we fully expect close coordination on bilateral, regional, and global issues to continue with the new cabinet. Go ahead. Thank you. China yesterday appointed a new ambassador to Afghanistan under Taliban's regime. Uh, I would like to ask you what's your reaction and whether the United States will take a, such a step in the near future or um, not. I I don't have any reaction to the Chinese um, uh, 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 
the Chinese, the Chinese government's decision to do that, and I don't have any announcements to make with respect to what uh, we will do. Alex, go ahead, and then we'll finish off. I have two questions on Russia's annexation policy you just were uh, talking about. Uh, G7 seven today uh, came up with a statement on sham elections, uh, condemned the action. Uh, the Secretary put one out last week the as Secretary well. Secretary also put it prior to the election, and he also pledged that there will be sanctions against individuals who would take part of it, which raised you know, high expectations. Are they too high at this point? No. When should we expect sanctions? I never preview those, but those elections only closed, I think, on Friday, and today's Wednesday, so it takes some time to put these things into effect. So G7 statement is not enough? So, uh, um, I mean, it's not your, let's say, final... I, I am uh, not going to announce or preview any sanctions. You've probably gotten used to hearing me, th me say okay. this. Any pre preview or announce any sanctions decision determinations before, that they are, before they are made. Fair enough. Now that sham election is over, we have uh, seen Russia is stepping up a little bit with its annexation strategy, uh, bullying other countries, in this case Azerbaijan, uh, for not recognizing Russia's quote unquote territorial integrity and by condemning uh, or uh, not respecting, let's say, the elections. Um, do you have any reaction? Uh, look, Russia has uh, proved through a number of actions in recent years um, uh, that it is not a neighbor you can really trust on to be a peaceful, tranquil, um, uh, stable neighbor that respects territorial integrity and sovereignty. And I would think every country in the region should be aware of that. But the, but the fact that they are uh, going out and talking about their inter territorial integrity by pitching Ukrainian territory to other countries. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, I did, and I stand by the, the, the comment I made. Thank you.